I want to salute each and every one of you for taking time out in your short lives to be here tonight. To try to focus on something bigger than each and every one of us because we want to be true to the tradition of black prophetic fire that says that there's something beautiful about being on fire for justice. Ooh, it's a beautiful thing. Oh, in a culture of fleeting pleasures, it's so magnificent to have enduring joy. It's got your, you got to find joy in serving others. You got to find joy in being willing to make sacrifices and take a risk. A lot of people tell you, oh, Brother West, it must be so lonely and marginal. You're trying to speak the truth. I don't have the full truth, but I'm having a good time. <laughs> I'm having a great time. And why? Because I want to be true to what went into me. I am who I am because somebody loved me. Somebody cared for me. Somebody attended to me. I, I can't even conceive of what it's like to make my move from womb to tomb without my mother Irene, without my father Clifton, without my brother Clifton and my sister Cynthia and Cheryl and my Shiloh Baptist Church folk and Reverend Willie P. Cook and Deacon Hinton and Sarah Ray, my Sunday school teacher and my vacation Bible school teacher. That's a love train. That's a love train. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. You all were kind enough to have John Coltrane playing. Did I hear some John Coltrane in here? I said, my God, I heard a little of my favorite things, or maybe Love Supreme, or maybe a little Giant Steps, or Impressions, or Expressions, or Ascension. That's the same Love Train. Oh, yes. And of course, love is all about what? Learning how to die in order to learn how to live. You can't really engage in love unless you're willing to give something up, be vulnerable, take a risk, make that leap of faith. And I come out of that love train that the Isley Brothers sing about in their caravan of love. Oh, yes. And when you talk about Frederick Douglass, oh, the most eloquent of ex-slaves in the modern world. And by eloquence, I mean what Cicero and Quintilian meant, wisdom speaking. And he did it in the face of what? In the face of what every black person in America for the last 400 years have had to come to terms with, which is a history of being terrorized, traumatized, and stigmatized. Isn't it something that in the face of terror, Douglas said, no, I don't want to create a black Al-Qaeda. I don't want to terrorize the folk who are terrorizing me. I don't want to gangsterize the folk who are gangsterizing me in the face of terror. I want love, but justice is what love looks like in public. So I want justice, and I want justice for everybody. Everybody. What a tradition. What a grand people at our best as an African people in the new world. And of course, black people, we have no monopoly on this. Not at all. Every culture, every civilization has dished out magnificent figures trying to not only be on fire for justice and freedom, but be on fire for truth, understanding that the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. You don't want a discourse of truth if you're not zeroing in on those, in the language of Malcolm X, catching hell. So I want to begin this talk with an epigraph from W.B. Du Bois. Just keep this in mind. He's 81 years old. He's in handcuffs. The United States put him, took him to court. He's worked with the Peace Information Center, trying to ban nuclear weapons all around the world. And he's viewed as working with a foreign agent. He's He's just married Shirley Graham Du Bois, a freedom fighter in her own right. They got married Valentine's Day, 1951. Two weeks later, he's in court. That's what you call a revolutionary twosome. <laughs> uh, Sly Stone would say it's a family affair. <laughs> But what does he do? He says, I have a plan to pass on to the younger generation the best of a tradition of struggle. So I'm going to embark on the writing of three novels in his 80s. Three novels. In the first novel, The Ordeal of Manzart, you turn to page 275 of that novel. He says, I've been wrestling with four questions my whole life. And the four questions that sit at the center 
of not just those who are full of black prophetic fire like David Walker and Harriet Tubman, but all human beings who choose to be on the love train. The first question, how does integrity face oppression? Integrity, we don't hear that word too much, certainly don't see it exemplified too much in the culture of cupidity, the love of money, society dominated by big money, big banks, big corporations, obsession with stimulation and titillation, being consumers rather than citizens, obsessed with getting over Avoiding the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about Wall Street criminals who walk off free, never get caught. And when they do get caught, they just have to pay money. Wouldn't it be nice if Jamal got caught with a crack bag and all he got to do is just call somebody up and give him some money? I got some friends with a lot of money. <laughs> and not have to go to jail. That's, that's been the case of the Wall Street criminals. Integrity. How does integrity face oppression? The second question, what does honesty do in the face of deception? Just being an honest person. James Baldwin says at the conclusion of the preface of Notes of a Native Son, all I want to be is just a writer and an honest man. And to have integrity or attempt to have integrity and be an honest woman or man is already countercultural. It's already counter hegemonic. You have to cut radically against the grain in your hood, neighborhood, on the job, in your mosque, in your church, in your temple. Why? Well, because I'm trying to be a person of integrity. Oh, you must be a leftist. No, I'm just trying to be a person of integrity. You must be revolutionary. No, I'm just trying to live a life of integrity and honesty and tell the truth. <laughs> Expose the lies. That's all. Don't try to peg me ideologically and politically. I got a morality and a spirituality that says this is the kind of life I want to live before I die and before the worms get me. That third query. What does decency do in the face of insult? Just to be a decent person, you got us insults, assaults, attacks coming at you. And that last query, how does virtue meet brute force? That's the boys, that's the starting point. That's the Sankofa of the black freedom movement. You don't move forward until you first look back. No John Coltrane without Johnny Hodges. No Aretha Franklin without Marion Williams. There's no Mary Lou Williams without Art Tatum. There's no Sarah Vaughan without that genius from Baltimore City named Billy Holiday. You got to look back. The landmarks, the set the standards, what the Greeks call arate, excellence, highest levels of excellence. And this book, in some ways, is my own love letter to the younger generation to the remind them that it's not only a beautiful thing to be on fire for justice, but in fact, the landmarks are crucial, they're necessary, they're catalysts for the work that you do in your culture, obsessed with weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> That's what corporate media is. It's not just mendacity and lies, but to keep folks so distracted that they can't attend to the crucial things of life and death and joy and justice and freedom and equality and democracy and rather distract them into those fleeting pleasures and instant gratification that somehow make them think that they're really alive when they're stimulated in order to become better consumers and keep the neoliberal capitalist and imperial project alive. <laughs> Oh yes, the formation of attention. You see. To be on fire for justice and fire for truth and fire for freedom is to be attended, attentive in a certain kind of way. What about the 38% of our precious children of color living in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world? That's a moral abomination, it's an ethical disgrace. How come we not attending to that? 
the quadrupling of our precious brothers and sisters on their way to the new Jim Crow in the language of Michelle Alexander. You see. 61% of them soft drug. We're not talking about murder. We're not talking about rape. We're talking about marijuana. We're talking about a little cocaine here. We're talking about some drug there. And yet you can torture in America and for America and there's no accountability whatsoever. Even our dear president said, yeah, we tortured some folks, but they were real patriots. Torture is a crime against humanity. It's a war crime. You don't let folk off for that kind of thing. And yet, drop you off. Where's our attention to our working people viewed as just marginal utilities that generate high levels of profits given the financialization of our monopoly capitalist regime that says what? More and more of the wealth hemorrhages at the top. 1% of the population now have 43% of the wealth. That's oligarchic, plutocratic, to some degrees pigmentocratic. Yeah, we got Ofer and some others up there, but. <laughs> the dominant tendencies of our society financialize, privatize, militarize. And look at the weak and the vulnerable, beginning with the children. The great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel used to say with such profound insight, you show me a people, show me a civilization that more and more is callous toward catastrophe and indifferent to evil, recognize that indifference to evil is more evil than evil itself. But indifference is the one trait that makes the very angels weep. That chilliness in your soul and that coarsening of your conscience that hardening of your heart, thinking that somehow you in the world all by yourself, for yourself, caught in your egocentric predicament. Oh, how quintessentially American it is these days. And you end up isolated, atomized, unable to relate, and our young people more and more even losing the very art of intimacy. I like to eavesdrop on my young folk. <laughs> That's why I spend a lot of time in hip hop studios. <laughs> they say, oh, here come that old school brother Wes again. <laughs> say, That's right, I'm bringing with me. I don't come by myself, I'm bringing my whole crew with me. I got Luther Vandross inside of me. I got some Jimi Hendrix inside of me. I got some. Gladys Knight inside of me. I got some Wanda Hutchison of the emotions inside of me. And I tell them, they were all originals. I look at y'all, I see too many copies. I say, they were creations and inventions. I see too many imitations. And some of you still going to be highly successful because success oftentimes doesn't have much to do with your merit. Some of y'all making hundreds of thousands of dollars and can't sing in tune. <laughs> Carmen McRae turns over in her grave. Johnny Hodges, Johnny Hartman turns over in his grave. I won't say anything about Nat King Cole. <laughs> and they part of the same tradition I'm a part of. The musicians are constitutive of the tradition. They're not marginal, they're not ornamental. There's no Martin without Mahalia. There's no Stokely without Curtis Mayfield and Nina Simone, you see. But our young people so hungry, so thirsty for the quest for that unarmed truth to keep track of the suffering and especially so thirsty for unapologetic love. Let's just be honest about it. <laughs> oh, Lord. This love letter, the attempt to bequeath black prophetic fire to the younger generation is an attempt to say almost like John Coltrane. You remember the John Coltrane gave a concert at Temple University, November 11th, 1966. He's there with some young people. He was intergenerational. We got McCoy on, on the piano. McCoy was a teenager when he started. He could have gone with Red Garland. We got an old brother Elvin on the drums, Elvin Jones. We got Albert Eilid, got Eric Dolphy playing. And he reaches a point 
where he puts his horn down and he starts singing. And then he stops singing and he starts beating his chest. And that love supreme is coming through him in such a way that he no longer even allows for the horn to mediate the raw feeling, the raw talent that he's at work in expressing the music. Because he's reached the edge. He can't take it anymore. And that's where we are right now when it comes especially to the plight and predicament of poor people and working people and young folk. Some of us are on our way to Ferguson. Keep Monday in mind. If you're religious, say a prayer. If you're not religious, think lovely thoughts. As the Peter Pan play would say, think lovely thoughts because we're going to have a massive civil disobedience in Ferguson on Monday. <laughs> massive. We're going to fill up the jails the way they did in Birmingham. And we're going to bear witness and tell the world, you chocolate brothers and sisters, somebody loves you, somebody cares about you, don't think you're in the world all by yourself. <laughs> that Michael Brown's body sitting in that street affects us at a level that's done every 28 hours, some young brother, sister, chocolate shot by the police of vigilante. And we're not even talking about the ones that shooting each other. But oh, we're in a different moment now. We're not since 1992 with Rodney King did you get all of the black gangs together. And that's what happened in Ferguson. You see. So you can see the fear in the police. Oh my God. These folks start channeling all of this rage in a way that's headed toward justice rather than killing each other. This is a different moment. You don't say. That's exactly right. That's what we want. That's what we need, but the challenge is gonna be, can we pass on to the younger generation the expression of that rage like Douglas and Du Bois and Ella Baker and Ida B. Wells Barnett and Malcolm X and Martin King through love and justice rather than hatred and revenge? That's the challenge. There's got to have a moral quality and a spiritual content to it because the rage is going to come. America, you're gonna reap what you sow. Sooner or later, you got to come to terms with those who have been sacrificed for your progress. Yes. It could be gentrification of the power grab and the land grab. Where are the poor people going? Might not be concerned, but sooner or later, there's going to be some blowback. Because our destinies are inextricably interwoven together. Not just in Seattle, not just in America, but with our precious brothers and sisters in Latin America and Middle East and Asia and Africa. With impending ecological catastrophe, possible nuclear catastrophe already at work. The spiritual catastrophes given the spiritual malnutrition and moral constipation of too many of our fellow citizens. And then the political catastrophe, my God. Not just two parties tied to big money and big corporations, mean-spirited, cold-hearted Republicans or milk-toast, spineless Democrats. Uh, but they polarize. They're so deeply polarized, they can't get nothing done other than vote for money for the killing machine. The U.S. and Philly, oh, you get some consensus there. Deep consensus there. Even my dear brother Bernie Sanders, I love that brother. Oh, I love that brother. He's strong. But I tell my brother, oh, now you know that a Palestinian baby has the same value as a Jewish baby. A Jewish baby has the same value as a Palestinian baby. We got to love all the babies. And 500 Palestinian babies gone. A critique has to be put forward. Every one of them not walking around with a shield. Where's the moral outrage? You have to have integrity, moral consistency, what Jane Austen called constancy. I like that little early Victorian term. <laughs> constancy. Oh, but Jane Austen was talking about a vicious practice called patriarchy. Psychic violence. Trying to tell more than half of the humankind that they're less intelligent, that their place is only to be subordinate, 
moral consistency. Same is true with our precious gay brothers and lesbian sisters. Same is true with our bisexual and transgender brothers and sisters. And it's not a matter of PC chit chat. It goes right back to Du Bois, integrity, honesty, decency, and a sense of virtue. And of course, it's always a orientation that gets you in deep trouble. Yes, indeed. But oh, we got some songs in the black freedom movement. There's a song called Wade in the Water. Wade in the Water. God going to trouble the water. Like that third verse in the first chapter of Nahum. God has God's way in the whirlwind, the same whirlwind that Marcus Garvey talked about when he said, I'm coming back in a whirlwind because the world has made being black a crime. I intend to make it a virtue. And he's already talking about the criminalization of black folk and black youth. And we could say some similar things about our precious brown youth or our yellow youth. And my God. Our precious indigenous peoples don't have to be in the room for us to be hypersensitive to the World War I that started in 1492 and it continues to this day. <laughs> to this day. We gotta tell the truth. We gotta tell the truth. So, well, oh, Brother West, you're always sounding so anti-American. I'm not anti-American, I'm anti-injustice in America. <laughs> I'm anti-injustice in Ethiopia. I'm anti-injustice in Guatemala. I'm anti-injustice in Somalia, in Vietnam. It's the kind of Negro I am. <laughs> Jesus loving free black man. I don't believe that Christians have a monopoly on anything, given our vicious history, the treatment of our Jewish brothers and sisters and the vicious history of treatment of women. But there's still something about that love. And it does not, it's connected not simply to justice. The great Ryan Honeber used to say, any justice that's only justice soon degenerates into something less than justice. Justice is rescued only by something deeper than justice, namely love. But love is subversive, it's revolutionary. Because when you really love folk, especially when you really love poor and working people, you hate the fact that being, they're being treated unjustly. You loathe the fact they're being treated unfairly. And if you don't do something, the rocks are gonna cry out. That's the fire in the bones you get in Jeremiah and Hebrew scripture. And it's in every one of the six figures. And I could have gone on and on and on. I, we talk about Fannie Lou Hamer, wish I had a chapter on her. Talk about James Baldwin, wish I had a chapter on it. And I'd write a dissertation on Curtis Mayfield. <laughs> it's true. As I tell the young folk all the time, can you imagine sustaining your soul with the music that has been composed and created since 2001? <laughs> I'll tell them, I, I would be... Almost on my way to the crack house. <laughs> you can't talk about black prophetic fire unless you talk about deep cultural expressions beginning with the music because music has been the privileged means by which oppressed people and especially black people get some distance from their pain and when that music is thin you're going to have thin character you're going to have thin leadership it's going to be empty it's going to be vacuous you're going to be it's, it's going to be difficult let's just be honest about it why do you think young folk no longer have groups to sing in harmony like the Delphonics and the Dramatics and the Whispers and the Emotions and the Jones Sisters and the Temptations and the Miracles and Enchantment and on and on and on? You got to learn how to listen. You got to bounce one voice against the other. They don't do that anymore because the oligarchs who control radio and recording and video, all they want is isolated voices, aggressive and no sense. No sense whatsoever of what a giant. Otis Redden meant when he said, try a little tenderness, not say my name, say my name, say my name. <laughs> oh, this is serious business, y'all. 
Because if justice is what love looks like in public, tenderness is what love feels like in private. And this book is an attempt to be true to the voices of a David Ruffin. Of a Barry White, gentle giant. <laughs> of a Donny Hathaway. What is it about those voices? Integrity, honesty, decency, virtue. And I'm not talking about the lives they live. They're flawed like all of us. We're all cracked vessels and we all at our best trying to love our crooked neighbors with our crooked hearts. <laughs> I'm talking about the voice. The anthem of black people is what? Lift it, not echo every voice. And you get into that voice, you can hear it in Miles' trumpet. That voice is different than even the life that he lives because that voice is bouncing off the sound of Louis Armstrong, the genius of all geniuses. It's bouncing off Clark Terry. It's bouncing off Clifford Brown. Can we be true to that voice where there is that militant tenderness? That subversive sweetness. You see, when I was coming along, we just assumed uh, that there would be a certain prophetic fire because there was Sly Stone saying, Stan, you've been sitting much too long. There's a permanent crease in your right and wrong. Stan, there's a cross for you to bear. Things to go through if you going anywhere. Stan, there's a midget standing tall and a giant beside him about to fall. Hit it, Larry. <laughs> We had Gil Scott Heron. We had Nina Simone talking about to be young, gifted, and black. Subversive sweetness. You see, soulful music, soulful interaction is the sharing of a soothing sweetness against the backdrop of catastrophe coming at you. And our young folk, they haven't experienced enough militant tenderness and subversive sweetness and a radical gentleness. I've been teaching in prisons now for 37 years. On Friday nights, this past semester of three hours, we rich dialogue in Rawway, state prison in Rawway that produced the escorts to look over your shoulder with Sylvia Robinson and the miracles and the, and the moments in the background. In those prisons, what do you see? Lives too often bereft of tenderness, sweetness, gentleness. That's the raw stuff that goes into our radical analysis of powers that be of big banks and big corporations, of politicians who are characterized more and more by legalized bribery and normalized corruption vis-a-vis -vis that big money. By a corporate media that ensures that it's a culture of superficial spectacle but no serious public debate and public conversation for the issues that really matter for the future of the nation, but especially the future of the vast majority of the nation who are working class and poor. You see? Or a serious discussion about drones that drop bombs on innocent peoples. Or increasing police powers that allow persons, Americans, to be assassinated without due process or judicial review. Or will detain folk like myself. And I don't mind. Because I reached the point a long time ago. Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? I've already done all the damage I want to do and can't wait to do more. <laughs> That's what I'm called to do. And I do it with a smile against the backdrop of the Theolonious monk playing epistrophe. Why? Because when that love has been put in you, the fire put in you, you then proceed. There's a wonderful song in my church by Walter Hawkins called, What Is This? What is this that 
makes him a wanton. To try to tell the truth, try to expose the lies, try to bear witness. What is this that sets one on fire? I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, I can't hold my peace. And it's precisely that same kind of love. Same kind of love. Just a willingness to step out on nothing and land on something. That's what being progressive in America is. Stepping out on nothing. Too much sleepwalking. Let that baby express herself. <laughs> oh yeah, it's about the babies now, y'all. I said, Marvin Gaye, who really cares? Who's willing to live and die to tell the truth for the babies? You see, you look like Coltrane at the edge. And I would hope that more of us would be, yes, at the edge. And how do we proceed? First, we acknowledge we have to be able to come together and create alliances and coalitions that seriously target the most difficult issues, beginning with the litmus test, the legacy of white supremacy. That's the litmus test. That's the litmus test, you see. But it's not because black people have a monopoly on suffering. Not at all. But in the formation of the United States, the fundamental threat to the status quo is when you fall in love with black people, when you're concerned about their plight and predicament and you make it central and fundamental to your analysis of class and empire and gender and homophobia and so forth. You see. I mean, too many black folk, of course, stop when it comes to the issue of white supremacy. You say, no, we got some other issues. We got patriarch we got to come to terms with. We got homophobia and we certainly got class. And I talk in the book about the re-niggerization of the black professional class. Oh yes, very important, very important. We've got some very, very talented, smart and brilliant black people in positions of status and prosperity and living well, but they're still scared and intimidated and afraid to tell the truth. And they don't want to reach out with the folk who are still catching hell. They want to say, look at me, look at me, like they some kind of... Yeah, I know I'm in town hall here. <laughs> no, it's some kind of peacock. Look at me, look at me. Peacock strut because they can't fly. No, we come from a people fly like eagles. Everybody knows we had different black leadership if black middle class kids were going to jail at the same level as black poor children. We'd have different kind of black leadership if black middle class kids had to go to the same school as poor black kids. We want no one to go to those schools, but poor children have exactly the same status as any other child. I don't care what class, I don't care what color. All of the six in this text had a linked fate with those on the bottom. They didn't romanticize the bottom. Of course, there's gangsters there because there's gangsters in high places, middle places, all places. I was a gangster before I met Jesus and now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. <laughs> it's inside of me too. So it's not a matter of just finger pointing, it's a matter of trying to make certain kind of choices and being true to those who came before. But it's something these days to see the, 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 the parade of such talented black folk in high places. I'm not just talking about the brother in the White House, White House built by black folk. <laughs> but I'm talking about professionals across the board. What do you think about the prison? What's happening with Jamal and Letitia? Oh, they need to pull their pants up. <laughs> Michael Brown had his pants pulled up. Kanisha did too. Oh, but when your child gets victimized, and it might be the, the rare ink spot in a vanilla suburb, but when your child gets victimized, all of a sudden you get radical. Oh, we got to do something. We got a crisis. We got a catastrophe because my child 
is in trouble. Well, yes, we're going to be with you for your child. But you know what? What took you so long? What took you so long? Where's your sense of morality? Where's your sense of spirituality? And this is true for our poor white brothers and sisters. Often overlooked, not just in Appalachia, but right here in Seattle. This is true for brown, this is true for yellow. The coming together. Each one of these figures in this text ended calling for some kind of multiracial alliance. And you say, well, it took Malcolm a little while, didn't it? Yes, it did. Because he was a gangster for a good while, Malcolm Little, until Elijah Muhammad loved him into his sense of possibility. And the depths of Malcolm's love for black people, we don't have a language for. But because it got stuck on the chocolate side of town initially, and he thought that white brothers and sisters were devils, and he's wrong about that, but he thought they were devils, but the love was still in him. And when he concluded, lo and behold, white folk not devils, it's just too many of them still engage in devilish behavior. <laughs> he still had a point. <laughs> He still had a point. He said, there's always fundamental spaces for John Brown and Ann Braden and Miles Horton and those white brothers and sisters to play a crucial role. Why? Because it's a question of integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue. And every human being can make choices in that direction. No one of us are imprisoned by our skin color, our gender, our sexual orientation, our regional identity, our national identity. It is a human thing. And oh my God, we need that today. And I'm just so glad and so grateful you all have taken this time to allow me to say a few words. I hope a strong enough catalyst to unsettle and unnerve you enough to either reinforce the fire you already have or to rekindle the fire for justice, the love of truth, the love of neighbor, the love of democracy, radical democracy that zeroes in on the dignity and the decency of those sly stone called everyday people. Thank you all so very much. My dear brother. Good afternoon, Dr. Cornell West. I'm sorry doing? I have to lean over here. No, that's all right, that's all right. Uh, in light of the murder of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Sean Bell, that's right. the rapings of uh, the young 16-year-old girl known as Jada, uh, the poor teacher who was accosted by a police officer, in light of all this going on here now and today, I believe that the only way that we will be able to take care of ourselves yes, yes. is if we find value in ourselves. Yes, that's and I right. think the problem with today's young black people is that we don't have value in ourselves. What should we do to find that value and what can I do to teach that value to my peers? Mm, wonderful. Oh, so stay, stay right there so we get a chance to see each other. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I appreciate you starting us off on a high note, brother. <laughs> on a very high note. Definitely. And in fact, I think you in part know the answer to that question because you're already doing it. It's a matter of self-love, self-respect, self-regard that young people have to see in clear proximity examples of self-respect and self-regard. It's not the kind of thing you learn solely in a book. Now reading can make a difference, no doubt about that. You can read Toni Morrison, they can read James Baldwin, they can read Ralph Ellison, you see. But they have to be able to see it. One of the reasons why I started with my presentation in terms of the figures I was mentioning mom and dad, the folk in church and so forth. I could see it, I could feel it, I could reach out and touch it. You see? So it's so much inside of me that 
I, there's no way I could do without it, no way I could eliminate it if I wanted to. You see, that's what young folk need. They could feel it, I could feel it in the music. I knew Curtis Mayfield loved me. He's sacrificing himself. They wouldn't even allow We went on the radio, still went number one. And it was a month before Martin died, March 1968, where it went number one. The record came out in 67. And the record that it was after that was sitting on the dock of the bay by Otis Redden, who had died in December of 67. You could feel the love in it. And I haven't got the Shirley Caesar yet. Uh, James Cleveland, you see what I mean? We have to have our young people in situations where that love is palpable. And in schools and other places. And this is one of the attempts of a movement, especially in a movement of spiritual malnutrition and spiritual blackout. But young folk can see it. They want to see sermons, not just hear them. And I think that's precisely what they need, a kind of renaissance of self-regard, self-respect, and self-determination to go hand in hand. But also self-defense, because see, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a pacifist. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, though, brother. Uh, thank you so much. Is there, yes, indeed. Oh, my brother. I just want to say you were wonderful. I would love to see you do a, a chapter on James Baldwin, maybe, Ooh, yeah. maybe including the, uh, the quote where he says, uh, every white person, no matter what he or she says, knows one thing. They know they wouldn't want to be black here. And if they know that, that's all they need to know. Ooh. James Baldwin. That's, that's Baldwin right there. And we so say, well, the, maybe on Friday night there once in a while, then bounce back to whiteness on the weekend. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, bro. I'm just kidding, though, brother. No, um, <laughs> what I learned from the Zimmerman trial was that if you're black, you can't dress for the weather. You got to dress for the racism in the area. And the only safe outfit is MC Hammer pants and the Bill Cosby sweater. Ah, uh -huh. yeah, 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 like yeah, that? yeah, 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 yeah. Now, do, do, you, do you have a question? Cause you, oh, you, you on a roll. Yeah. You on a roll, brother. I have you a question. You on a roll now. Okay, I got a question. I don't want to stop your roll in your um, spirit now. How do you talk to the preachers and yes. figure out how to make cannabis legal because they only arrest us? How about that? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Well, in some ways, too, it, it takes us to uh, one of the things I didn't zero in on. There once was a time in which we had significant numbers of churches that were prophetic. And you had preachers who were not business leaders, but were pastors. Mm -hmm. And you had choirs, not just stimulating praise teams. <laughs> oh, yes. And the churches had prison ministry, not just building fun. You see what I mean? We've got to first keep track of those prophetic churches. I know you got some prophetic black churches in Seattle. I know you know that. I've been there a few of them. Not enough. Somebody hollered out one. What, what's one? Mount Zion. That sounds Baptist. What about AME? <laughs> first AME. <laughs> First day in me. I'm Baptist, so I understand. First you got first. First day in me. We need more churches like that willing to take on patriarchy, homophobia, class privilege, prison ministry, and imperial crimes. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Absolutely. Zeroing in on the young folk. Trying to somehow ensure they, they don't remain so unattached to the love. You see. Because most young people are unchurched today. They're unmasked, they're unsynagogued. Music is the last form of transcendence for them. The last form of, thank you so much, my brother. Thank you, thank you so very much. Go right ahead, my brother. Hi, um, uh, Dr. West. Um, first want to say, Tlaso Kamati. Thank you very much, Maestro. Thank you very much, teacher. Um, oh, thank you. A few things. I have a lot of emotions, right? Um, yeah. I'm actually a uh, public high school teacher. Uh, just entered my fourth year. And um, we are a rare breed. We are a rare breed, uh, males of color, in the high school. 
And um, I think uh, uh, a big piece of that is um, uh, high schools, like our prisons, we're looking at the face of hegemony. And um, uh, one of the things I want to thank you is for keeping me, uh, your words, your wisdom, keeping me in the classroom. Um, so I really want to thank you for that. Um, I also really want to thank you for broadening the discourse with regards to race, with regards to class oppression. Um, um, I'm relatively new to the Seattle area. I've been out here mm. for about eight years. And mm. um, uh, we have a very uh, white-black dichotomy out here. And, um, and we're working through it, right? We're working through it. So I, I really want to thank you for that. Um, my question revolves around the issue of radical love. Radical love in the public high school, mm -hmm. the public high school classroom. Um, we, 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 don't, we don't use that word a lot. Wow. We don't use that word a lot, love, wow. right? Yeah. And um, I just uh, more or less want, want to get your thoughts on um, what, what is this concept? You know, how, how does it look like? You know, how can we uh, conceptualize it and, and how, can we, um, how can we practice it in our classrooms? Um, that, that's something that I'm struggling with. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, particularly with those students that, that you know, we, we see are, are, um, um, are, are messing it, right? Are, are not being loved, are not being told that, that you know, I love you. Yes, um, yes. So I just want to get your thoughts on, on just the issue of radical love and uh, how it looks like in, in the, uh, the, the public uh, classroom or just the, the classroom in general, whether it be elementary, uh, high school, or, or All the way up. No, yeah. salute the work you're doing, though, brother. You're already a force for good. Yeah. Already Thank a force you. for Thank good. Thank you. But yeah. um, definitely. But I mentioned just briefly, you see, one of the challenges of, of love is that it is always on intimate terms with death. You see, it is impossible to love without something dying in you so that you are reborn into something more mature, compassionate, and, and risk-ridden. That's the vulnerability that's built into love. And I was talking about how young people lose the very art of intimacy. You can go to their parties. And they don't dance together as if they really know each other. It's just body-to-body -body stimulation. You see, you put on the Dells and they don't know what to do. Because <laughs> the Dells is not about body stimulation. Always together is not about body stimulation. Stay in my corner ain't either. See what I mean? So the question becomes, as a teacher, what needs to die in me so that I can be an exemplary person who's reborn, connected to these young folk who need to have something to die in them, the self-hatred is putting themselves down, thinking lowly of themselves to be reborn to what the brother was talking about, the self-respect and so forth. And that's true, not just one-on-one, -on -one, it's true institutionally. You see, you go to the schools, what happens? It's like going to the airport, you go through the military, schools are militarized. That's already signs right there. Right? Then you get there, there's no arts programs. Where's the imagination going to be peaked? Where's the cultivation of those sides of the self different than the more quantitative analysis? Quantitative analysis is crucial. But we know rich kids get taught, poor kids get tested. You see? The test, major criteria for teacher, major criteria for students, and students told every three months in the newspaper, achievement gap, achievement gap, achievement gap. And I think to myself, well, I know some well-to-do Schools that have spiritual deficits. Let's talk about those too. Let's talk about the moral deficits some of them have. On the way to becoming head fun. Heschel used to say, you view life as a goal, rush, you end up worshiping a golden calf and you reduce the golden rule to he or she who has the goal rules. But that's sick. That's spiritually pathological. No civilization can survive with that basic orientation, but no matter what color they are. And you say, there is an alternative way of, of dealing with our classroom, in your own example, and then trying to put pressure on your principals, administrators, and others. And there are such magnificent persons all around this country who share the kind of work you're doing. It's just very difficult to be, to be successful because in part they've got the financial eyes and the big money for privatizing education, trying to grab the folk on the top and those who are left behind get further and further behind on the way to the prison industrial complex. 
And that's what needs to be called into question. Sorry to have a long answer, but a very important question. Very important question. My dear sister, how yes, you doing? Yes, how are you? So good to see you. It's good to see you. Uh, my name is Karen Vargas. We come from Kitsap County. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we got Kitsap in the house. We're living life leadership. We have the awesome opportunity to work with the Freedom School this summer, right here in, in this area, very and with important. the youth on doing institutionalized racism. One of the things I want to ask is what are we doing? How are we really looking at that school to prison pipeline with students of color and poverty and those that are not being served and how they are being chatteled through that juvenile justice system, through our institutions, correctional institutions? What is happening that we are building a new jailhouse for young people, that we're not putting those resources into giving them support they need to be successful. Yeah, and those are, yeah. th those are big concerns. I'm a mother. Yes, yeah. I'm a mother. I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about what the direction we're leading our young people and the message that we're sending them at such a developmental stage. Absolutely. No, I'm, 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 I'm with you. I'm with you, sister. Oh, Lord, yes. And I know that you've worked with that school to prison pipeline. I know you and Travis have spoken and sat down and had, had forums on and everything, but what's really being done in a community setting in our communities in our states mm -hmm. that we really need to look at it in our own communities to transform and change those things absolutely no indeed indeed i mean i i would start with um, michelle alexander's book the new jim crow yes the wonderful thing about that book is, and of course, Angela Davis and so many others have been voices in the wilderness about yes. this for decades. But there is now an escalating motion and momentum, a whole cloud of witnesses and voices saying exactly what you said. So there has been movement. Yes. Even the Department of Justice, after tremendous pressure on Brother Eric Holder, after he let the Wall Street criminals free, he let the torturers free, he started making noises, some good noises, about the prison industrial complex, which means that that pressure is being felt, but at that grassroot level, grassroot. it is expanding. So in that sense, it's very, very positive. And it's not, as you know, just in black and brown communities. You've got white churches, now beginning to wake up and talking about restorative justice, we've been too punitive. Then you got many right wing brothers and sisters, some of whom oftentimes are much too uh, limited in their compassion saying, well, it's really a matter of philosophic calculus, it's a matter of cost benefit analysis, and we save money if we were somehow more oriented toward reform in our prisons. <laughs> so you get a kind of overlapping and a focus on the new Jim Crow in that sense, so that there is movement, but we need more community groups, you're absolutely right. One more question. Mm -hmm. What would you say to our young people here concerning their own, what would you speak into them concerning their own behaviors that would transform that and really spearhead a movement for themselves how, what would you say to them? Oh, I'd say to young folk, in some sense I'd say what I'd say to older, old school folk, but uh, I would say work hard, love hard, play hard. Now if you work hard, you're critically engaged. If you play hard, you get outside of your ego and you evolve to something bigger than you. And if you love hard, you love enough to straighten your back up and speak candidly and act honorably and be willing to sacrifice your popularity for a cause bigger than you. Now see, all of us need to hear that, but we could zero in on our young folk on that. Thank you. Oh yes, absolutely. Go right ahead, my brother. All right, uh, Dr. West, yes. T. West. Oh, your brother West too? Uh, brother from another mother. Oh, oh your yeah. brother, my cousin. You boy must be cousin. <laughs> Um, recently in the Washington Post, there was a headline that stated, whites think discrimination against whites 
is a bigger problem than bias against blacks. The question is this. Number one, why? <laughs> <laughs> Number two, there's two more parts to this. Number two, if this can be changed in a positive way, how would we go about doing it? Mm. No, I appreciate the question. One is, though, I tend to have a kind of hermeneutics of suspicion when it comes to these polls and bourgeois newspapers. <laughs> I really do. I really do. You know what I mean? I mean, the idea that there's a significant numbers of white brothers and sisters who live a life of denial and self-deception is not new. Everybody know that. You know what I mean? I want to know how many white brothers and sisters are waking up. How many of them are piercing through the lies? How many of them are calling into question? The See, the bourgeois newspaper not going to put that in there, you know? It used to be 18% of white folks sleepwalking. Now you got 35. They're not going to highlight that. They're going to say 65% of white folk still in denial. You don't say. <laughs> and the sky is blue and the grass is green, you know? So, you see what I'm saying? Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have a major challenge, but as black folk, we always have a major challenge. This is why we got to expand the number of white folk who really make fundamental sacrificial choices of integrity, honesty, decency, and then embrace them in who they are, even as you keep them honest and candid and allow them to keep you honest and candid. It's a mutual reciprocal affair. And once that broadens out, we got something. So in that sense, it's a different kind of lens through which to view. See, a lot of these polls, and first of all, you always wonder, who are they calling? I've never been called once myself. <laughs> never been called. One time, I'm 61 years old, never been called. <laughs> but the, the other side is that there's, they, they shape the discourse in a certain way that tend to almost paralyze us sometimes, you see. And that, uh, and we've got to be able to accent certain, not just hope, and not hope in an abstract sense, hope is movement, keep on keeping on. That's the hope. Anytime you're getting up and on the way toward integrity, honesty, and decency, and on the move toward trying to be a force for good, that's hope because it's embodied, it's enacted. It's something that's palpable. So that's, that's, that's an initial response to that. So don't you get too paralyzed by these bourgeois polls, though, brother. <laughs> no, definitely. I'm telling you, that's my dear sister. Definitely. Brother West, 73% uh, of Ferguson, Missouri is, are people of color, but they only make up 6% of the electorate. Here in the Seattle area, we passed a livable wage law last year mm. and going door to door convincing people to vote themselves a raise to create an environment to believe that this ballot would actually change their world by the first of the year the very next year was one of the toughest things i've ever sold in oh, my yeah. life and you yeah. would think i want to vote myself a raise i sure do um so i have a hard time figuring out how to get through the distrust and the apathy to action. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, that, that is a uh, perennial challenge. It's always there. It's always there. One, you ha we always have to keep in mind that uh, not only people wake up at different times in different ways, but everybody never, ever wakes up. Ever. You see. Every, every fundamental historical moment of transformation, be it American, French revolutions, Haitian revolutions, velvet revolutions in Eastern Europe, it's never the vast majority. It's a highly qualitative slice of a minority who are on fire that begin to call into question the lukewarmness of the mainstream, and the mainstream begins to tilt in an opposite direction, you see. And that's one of the things we talk about in the text in terms of the 1960s. The 1960s was not, it was not a mass movement. The, 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 the most black people were not behind Martin Luther King Jr. His own church booted him out of his denomination, J.H. Jackson. 
the National Baptists. They had to form the Progressive Baptists. That's in the black church, let alone the black community. When Martin died, 55% of black people disapproved of him because he was critical of the American Empire in Vietnam and trying to bring poor people together across the board. Carl Rowan and others wrote pieces. He's an he's a extension of communism and so forth and so on. You think, God, if they don't love Martin, then what did he think about us? <laughs> but look at his impact because he had that high quality group of crit that critical minority, put it that, prophetic minority. And the struggle here of living wage. I mean, Seattle and my dear sister, uh, Sawant and uh, Kashama and others, you, you all have been a magnificent inspiration. We pushed increasing the minimum wage in New York, partly because of Seattle, you see? Cuomo and the others were very reluctant until they saw what was going on in Seattle. So it has repercussions even far beyond even given the, the magnificent work you're doing, but feeling frustrated. So that the frustration is part of the fire, of course. You know, it's, it, it, you're never able to really do what you want, just like the brother in the class. You want to touch every student. You can't touch every student, even though you want to, but the ones that you do touch, you make a difference. You make a difference. And without you, without you, and the others wouldn't have had that, we wouldn't have had that impact in New York. Because our working people, no matter what color, if they are not treated with dignity, which is very difficult in a highly financialized monopoly capitalist world, right, then the class struggle, the class tensions will increase. Because, oh, America has no classes, we just have consumers. That's a lie. <laughs> That's why the business roundtable meets. And they do not include head of trade unions. That's class consciousness. But uh, thanks so much. Go right ahead. So of all the things I could thank you for, I want to thank you tonight for the turn of phrase, weapons of mass distraction. Oh, yeah, I um, appreciate that. And as easy as it is to tell the young people who are close to us uh, to duck and cover, hide under the desk uh, in the face of those weapons. What do you see that's working uh, against the proliferation of the weapons of mass distraction? A as I check my phone and while you're answering. Keep in mind, my dear brother, that when I say weapons of mass distraction, it, 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 it's not simply those nuclear toys that could blow up the whole planet, mm -hmm. but it's those cultural messages that are sent every day trying to tell women, always view yourself through the male normative gaze. See what I mean? You see? In the video, you know, you got a great entertainer like Beyonce. No Aretha, no Gladys. She ain't Jill Scott, she ain't Andrew Stone, but she's a very good entertainer. But the videos become more and more crypto pornographic. That, that's the male gaze. I got a daughter. I don't want her to view herself through solely the male gaze. She's not an object for male predatory behavior. <laughs> See what I mean? But that's a distraction. That's a distraction. I want her to attend to the things that matter in regard to her own dignity, integrity, and so on. So that's one example among others. But the... Uh, but the anti-nuclear movement must continue. We almost forgot when the Cold War supposedly came to an end. And now it's back again. And Russia still has the nuclear heads and the United States still have the nuclear heads pointed against each other. Pointed against our cities and pointed against theirs. We forgot. William Sloan Coffin and others, the great anti-nuclear activists. We never forget their witness. The Daniel Berrigans, our Jesuit revolutionary brother and of course Dorothy Day Dorothy Day Ooh, what a giant reminding us of precisely that thank you so much though let's go right ahead myself unfortunately uh, this is our last question right here Ooh, and this is a young sister this young woman right here is our last question before doing that I just want to remind folks first of all that the signing line is going to run on the far side of the stage right here down uh, past the stained glass and downstairs uh, and I'll be there to help direct you when that happens 
Uh, and finally, after our last question, we're going to hear from our uh, Civics Roundtable partner, which is going to be happening downstairs in our pub area. Go ahead. No pressure, but uh, my question concerns the kids that look around their class and see maybe two people that look like them. So how do we overcome a system that we truly know is based off structural discrimination? Mm, I appreciate that question. Appreciate the question. Definitely. I think one, though, my dear sister, is a matter of recognizing the kind of world that we live in. And we live in a world where there's a whole host of evils. And we have to have the courage to look it in the face like structural discrimination. There's some other evils, too. And part of the process of making that move from youth to mature adulthood is becoming more and more aware of the evils but also having more courage and a willingness to be honest about them and confront them. So that for example, let's say in the classroom you see um, uh, uh, different kind of racist activity or racist discrimination and let's say in the curriculum you don't have enough black voices then you ask the teacher, you say, well, I, I see that you're very much into uh, white American writers. Maybe we should read some William Faulkner. <laughs> Vanilla Brother. Gut Bucket, Jim Crow, Mississippi Brother. Who's wrestling with structural discrimination. And who's got some profound things to say about it. And then from there, you, you, the teacher may be open to James Ball and a Tony Morris and a Ralph Ellison. Get them there slowly. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Just on the way. You see what I mean? So it's not just a matter of just waiting to see that there's a writer who looks like one, but there's some other writers who also have been wrestling with these issues, and he can tease out their insights and allow us to cross that bridge to some of the great brown and, and yellow and red and black writers, but that's the beginning. But good luck in your work. Thank you. Good luck in your work, definitely. Yes, 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 yes. How you doing, my dear sister? How are you doing? So good to see you. Hmm? Okay, so do you feel embarrassed by Nicki Minaj and Lil Wayne because of their lyrics? Because <laughs> temptations don't talk about what they talk about now. My dear sister, you were so right. <laughs> you were so right that um, there is a rawness and a lewdness in the music that was not permissible when I was coming along. But I give you an example now. That you have to promise that you're not going to necessarily go off and check this person out, but I'm going to give you an example. All right. See, when I was your age, there was a brother named Rudy Ray Moore <laughs> with Dolomite. <laughs> that was a character. Rudy Ray Moore, wonderful brother, I hug him, but he rude, lewd, and raw. <laughs> he was not allowed to be projected in the mainstream public life. You had to steal away. And I stole away and checked him out, but I don't want you stealing away though, because <laughs> your mom and daddy and others love you. When you get older, you can check it out. But if Rudy Ray Moore were the main character when I was coming along, and Curtis Mayfield was pushed out, he was pushed out, you see. I would have a very different sense of myself. And what has happened in your precious generation is, is the lewd, raw, coarse, uh, uh, as I said, almost pornographic language and images that has been projected as if it's the public face of black people. 
And you see it in the movies. We don't have one black person that can green light a movie in Hollywood, and the only person who can green light one is Brother Tyler. I pray for that brother. <laughs> He's a talented brother. He came a long way, and I support him in his success because I, I don't believe that people's potential is trumped by their mediocrity. <laughs> he can be better. If colored girls was better than that Medea, one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> But I still believe in its possibility. But the fact that that is what is projected to our young folk over and over and over and over again. And the old folk go running too because black folk are hungry to see themselves. Now we're going to see what Brother Andre does with Jimi Hendrix. Andre 3000. I'm sure he's going to do a good job. That's going to be beautiful. The James Brown movie was not bad. James's genius is impossible to capture, but they did a good job. We need more film music that doesn't reflect those kind of lyrics that you're talking about. Now, now Nicki Minaj, she is an extraordinarily talented sister. She needs to spend more time with a genius from Dallas named Erica Badu. <laughs> That's what she needs. I'm Laura, I'm Laura Haldane. Yes, how you doing? Ariel Hart. We're yeah. part of Youth Undoing Institutional Racism. Whoa. And we're also here on behalf of Ending the Prison Industrial Complex. Yes, yes. So in King County, 10% um, of the population is black youth. And in our juvenile justice system, 46% of our black youth are incarcerated. Mm. And, and we've been building a movement against the building of this new youth jail that they're proposing. Right. <laughs> and, and we see this as a perpetuation of the prison industrial complex that seeks to imprison our br black and brown youth at disproportionate rates. But one barrier we've run into in the last few months is, is really having communities of color come together. And so my question is, how do we get uh, communities of color to be unified and accountable to each other so that we can work together to change the way our system works? And my question is, how do we en engage white liberals? <laughs> oh, yes, no, this is beautiful, this is beautiful. You all got a lot on the table there. Oh, yes. I think one of the great things about Ella Baker was, you keep Ella Baker, you know, she was executive director for Martin King's organization, and she was executive director for SNCC, Stokely Carmichael, Diane Nash, and the others organization. So she could move from older generation to younger. And it's probably because her love was so deep and her commitment to democratic theory and practice was so genuine that she was willing to to be organically connected to young people. We need more young people's organizations that are respectful of the older generation but also critical of the older generation. There's no way that you're gonna get folk my age, 60, 65 years old, deeply immersed in the prison industrial complex in the same way that young people will be because so many of the friends of young people are there. In and out, in and out. So that you shouldn't be fearful of forming your own organizations and coming together and, bring, and, and coming together with white liberal youth. White liberal youth are very different than Clintonites. <laughs> Not the same thing. Clintonites used to be white liberal, moved into neoliberal opportunism and just kind of skated to the end. <laughs> That's a different move. We've got some many white brothers and sisters who are on fire, are liberal in the sense that they're willing to, to engage. And of course, they've grown up in a culture that's been so Afro-Americanized that the, uh, you know, the M&Ms and the, uh, the, the, the what's, that, what's that brother, Thick? Oh. <laughs> what's his name? Robin Thick. He wants to be Marvin Gaye, but can't. 
No, but he's trying, he's trying. But the whole culture has been Afro-Americanized in terms of the, the young folk, that there is an openness. And, and you shouldn't think that you always have to go intergenerational. You learn from the older generation, but you're able to really do some of this on your own. And of course, I, in that sense, can't give you too much insight because I always come in from the outside as old school when it comes to young, younger generation. You, you heard of the Dream Defenders with Brother Phil Agnew, very important, very important organization. Uh, uh, hands up in, 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 in Ferguson, young people. Y young people are beginning now to forge their own infrastructure. It's a beautiful thing to see. And I know you all are part of that in dealing with the uh, prison industrial complex. I salute you. I salute you. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Indeed, indeed, indeed. My dear brother. Hi. My dear brother. Hi, thanks for, the, thanks for the opportunity for your taking questions. I just have one question about um, just trying to understand your work. And essentially what I'm trying to figure, what I would like to hear more about yes. is, your, is your understanding of like what radical or social, or like, ra like the, the radical part of radical democracy, what that actually entails. Um, it seems like there's an implicit, like almost, like, you, like a big theme of your talk is transcendence, and you yeah. talk about, in kind of theological language, like the, the system, the powers that be, oligarchy. Right, right. And then you're also talking about, like the, almost what seems like, like a transcendence of the individual, in terms of like you evoke like the Christ, and you evoke like these, you know, black prophets, so there's kind of like these two interacting theologically, theologically right. bound like transcendent people but on the one hand it seems like like that deification almost seems to like alienate the system or like it seems to alienate yeah. the realm of possibility that you're trying to open up and then yeah. on the other hand it seems like you're also like there's a there's like almost like a implicit deification of the individual not mm. in any sort of like blasphemous way right. but in terms of like evoking christ and, and elevating elevating transcendence yeah. virtue that yes. kind of thing so i'm just kind of my question is I'm, i want to there seems to be a tension here and i want to learn just as just so i can understand what you're saying um how do you reconcile what seems to be like a humanistic kind of impulse towards this sort of new culture that you're talking about and like a theological one. And why do you choose the theological spiritual one as like, you know, spirituality was a big like central theme. Why is that huge in your talk, in your, in your work, as opposed to like essentially de-radicalizing what you think everyone should already be doing? Does mm. that make sense? No, and that's a very profound and complicated question though, brother. <laughs> Definitely, but because the tension that you talk about is very real. You see, on the one hand, what I want is for all of us, whether we're religious or not, agnostic, atheist, or, or theist, to be able to get outside of our egoism. You see, so that democracy, justice, takes us outside of just our very narrow interests. And that's what spirituality acts as a vehicle towards. And the varieties of morality, varieties of spirituality that get us outside of our interests. We live in a system that tends to try to reduce us just to our egoistic interests. And somehow we've got to counter that, you see. So that when I talk about Frederick Douglass now, I am talking about a great human being, but he is human. He's still flawed too, and I have a critique of him, you see. And Martin and others, and even as a Christian, when I talk about Jesus, Jesus is profoundly human. So we don't want to in any way act as if there's so much on a pedestal yeah. that, that we no longer have some connection to them, can, be can, can no longer be inspired by them in light of the non-egoism they exemplified. Right. That they become examples of something bigger than our own particular ego. And atheists can, are, are, are candidates for that. Right. Agnostics are candidates for that. James Baldwin was, agnost was agnostic. Du Bois, we don't know. Looked like he was agnostic three days a week and had a theist moment and then would move right back into agnosticism. <laughs> but he was always concerned about something bigger than the ego. That's your crucial question. And that's just the beginning of an answer. But brother, we yeah. could have a seminar on your query. <laughs> Because that's a deep question. That's a profound question. Once again, we'd like to 
please thank Dr. Cornell West for coming. He will be signing books right over here. Books are on sale.